This is Star Talk. Hello, hello, Bill Nye here. I'm the host of a brand new series. Like it's like nothing you've ever seen. It's Star Talk, but this is Star Talk All Stars. That's right. And here with our regular comedian, uh, insightful man about the world, Chuck Nice. Oh, wow. I was looking around. Who's he talking about? Yeah. Yes, that's <laughs> me. Yes, <laughs> indeed. That's me, Bill. Dr. Nice. Gavin Schmidt is the director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. I guess that's yes. the NASA Goddard that's Institute. That's the NASA Goddard Institute, yes. And uh, you are one of the world's foremost authorities on climate change. So they keep telling me. <laughs> well, you've probably published a few papers. You've, I have, yes, yes. You've looked at thermometers. Occasionally. The occasional barometer. Uh, it's great to have you here, but this is Thanks. Cosmic Queries. Indeed. Uh, so uh, these are questions from out there. From out there. But this week on All Stars with Dr. Schmidt, it's going to be all about climate change. That's what it is. And we climate have change all the time. We've solicited questions from the Internet and uh, we have quite a bit. People are really interested in climate change. And we have uh, uh, from Facebook, Twitter uh, and every other place where you will find Star Talk. Uh, we have people who are writing in and they are asking us about climate change. So uh, I'm going to start off with a question uh, from one of our Patreon patrons. Oh, Patreon is yet another outlet. Yes, Patreon is another outlet where uh, you can find us. And where you uh, can go in and let us know that's on the right. outlet. That's right. It's brilliant. It is. And uh, the great thing about Patreon is that they actually support us financially, which is why we, uh, we take great pride in reading their questions. So well, let's, let's do that. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, this is from Dylan Hallahan, who says... Um, Sir William. Ah, that's you. Uh, in my area this year, it was 70 degrees outside on Christmas. Not only that, uh, but it didn't get cold until mid-January. And now we seem to have daily changes between 60s and 70s and snow. While I know that weather and climate are different, do you see this as a sign that everything we're trying to warn everyone about is coming even sooner? Uh, this reason, let me ask, where does he live? Uh, Washington Township, New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey, right down the street. Yeah, yeah. So we have had uh, some very exceptional weather here uh, over the winter. Um, it's been very warm, except for that one little period when it was very cold. And a lot of that is weather. A lot of that is, is tied to... Uh, Impacts of the the El Nino that's going on uh, right makes now makes everything it, warmer, right? It yeah. does make everything warmer. Oh, on, here on average, and particularly across the north of uh, the the U.S., uh, all the way across to Alaska, you're seeing record warm temperatures. Um, but they're record warm not because of the El Nino, but because we've had this long term warming that is just going on decade by decade by and decade. I say superimposed. You can. You can say that the El Nino fluctuations and the La Nina fluctuations are superimposed on that warming trend. Mm -hmm. So uh, a couple of years ago, we had very cold winters uh, here in, in New Jersey, New York area. Uh, and now I don't believe a word you say. <laughs> there you have it. Right. There you have it. Thank you you sure. just said it was cold a couple of years ago. It was. So it's over. I'm but, sorry. But if you, if you look over the global picture and, and you average everything, you average the cold areas and, uh, cold areas and the warm areas, areas, uh, what you see is that there's this steady uh, march towards warmer temperatures. Uh, last year was the uh, warmest year on record globally. Uh, January was the warmest January that's, that we have in that record. So this uh, was 180 years back, something like that? Uh, it goes back to the mid-19th century, yeah. And uh, we don't think it was warmer just before we started. So, so in fact, these are, these are the warmest decades that we're seeing uh, in, in maybe hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Wow. So now, um, with uh, specific re um, respect to the question, as we see this proliferation, does that mean that things are getting worse or uh, are these just anomalies within the occurrence itself? Uh, so there's no obvious reason why that particular pattern of weather should be associated with the trend that you're seeing. So they're mostly just oscillations on top of that long term trend. But that's what you're going to see. You're going to see winter periods getting shorter. You're going to see more exceptional warm weather in January and December and February. You're going to see earlier springs. And you think, oh, that's great. But actually, it's not so great. What's happening is that uh, around here, you know, things are budding very early. And then we're still going to get variability. We're still going to get frosts in, uh, in you know, in, 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 in March April. and in April, uh, which is very variable. And actually, you can do a lot of damage to, to right. crops, crops. Uh, and apples 
animals and, and things uh, like that. The big problem in, uh, in farming is the pests, the parasites and um, in, uh, voracious insects are showing up sooner and sticking around longer, which mm -hmm. means more insecticide, more herbicide, just more work. Right. If you can do it at all. I mean, in the West, you've got the issue with the, with the pine bark beetles, where there's, there's a, there's a six-week window while they kind of prepare themselves for winter. If it gets cold enough in that six-week window, then they won't be able to breed again until the next season. But if it doesn't get cold enough, they harden themselves to the winter and they're ready to go, you know, two or three times as fast as they would have done. And so part of the, the huge mountain pine bark beetle outbreak that they've had in the West, uh, all the way up through Colorado, uh, up to British Columbia... Um, has been uh, tied to the fact that it just hasn't been getting as cold. Hasn't been cold. So, so the warming trend is kind of like uh, a Barry White music to these pine bob beetles. It's you know kind of sets the mood for them. A little wine, a little. But the, he says you will never find. But I think he means you will always find. <laughs> yeah, I used to keep warm. Yeah, I'm, I'm English. We don't quite share the same cultural <laughs> touchstones. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. He's like, about. I'm English. Actually, <laughs> Barry White. Exactly. Yes, Who um, is this Barry White? <laughs> Shark Tice. British accent. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, Dr. Schmidt, Gavin, you said we don't think it was warmer before, let's say, uh, the middle of the 19th century. Right. But we kind of do it what we kind of do know it wasn't. When you look right. at ice cores and right. so on. So you can look at ice cores, you can look at tree rings, uh, you can look at where the glaciers were. We have actually records of, of, mm -hmm. of those. They leave imprints um, for crying out loud. Yeah, so if you, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the glaciers that are melting now, and you can see, okay, well, what's the stuff underneath them? How old is that, right? And that gives you an idea of when that glacier first kind of receding, went forward, right. right? And so now it's receding, but it went forward at some okay, point. Okay, I got you. When did that happen, right? You go back and you date these things, and it's a 1,000 years ago. It's 4,000 years ago. Otzi, the ice man that they dug up in Austria, mm -hmm. was 5,000 years since he'd been covered in snow. Uh, there are places in uh, Baffin Island, up in the Canadian archipelago, where we think that the stuff that's being uncovered is 120,000 years old. Wow. Right? So it's so, been cold there for the last 125,000 years. And now it's warm. And now, now it's, it's warm. warm. Yeah. Let's take the next question. All right, man. God. Our talk all stars. You know what I like about this conversation? It's so terribly uplifting. Um, <laughs> you got three kids, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Welcome to your future, kids. All right. Well, we're working on it. We're going to change the world here, people. Okay. So yeah, we uh, are changing the world. We are. Yes. Oh, for the better. Oh, okay. <laughs> Juan, <laughs> specified. Juan Carlos uh, uh, Ruiz from uh, Facebook says, Dear Mr. Nye, Given that the Earth experiences ice ages periodically, mm -hmm. what will happen to the next one, given the current state of our climate? So we've had ice ages before. Yep. Does this mean that we will not have another ice age? Or will it mean that this will precipitate an even greater ice age? What? What will it do? <laughs> what will it do? So, so we have had ice ages before. So the, the, the peak of the last ice age was about 20,000 years ago. Here in New York City, that was pretty much the edge of the, uh, of the ice sheet. Uh, it actually stopped in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not quite sure why it stopped in Brooklyn, but uh, uh, probably for a latte or something. But the, uh, those, those ice <laughs> ages... The ice, the ice ages. Yes. years ago. Yeah, the ice age is uh, driven by uh, the wobbles in the Earth's orbit, which, which are slow, but kind of persistent. Is this Milankovic? Milankovic cycles, that's exactly right. Okay, and guys, I'm sorry. Uh, please expound, because I have been left out. Milankovic? Yes. Uh, the yes. only Milankovic I know is Donald Trump's wife. So... <laughs> Uh, this was a different, we, the, the different this guy, this guy was, a, was, a, was a Serbian, and he did all these calculations while in jail for, for political activities in Serbia back in the, 19, back in the 1920s. Um, and so what he worked out was that uh, the, the orbit of the Earth uh, around the sun, as, so we all know it's an ellipse, but the, but the eccentricity of that ellipse moves in time, uh, basically because of uh, the influence of Jupiter and Saturn. It was. Uh, it does. It wobbles. And uh, the tilt of the Earth, that wobbles a little bit. And the precession of the Earth. So kind of where it's spinning around. It's like a world record on a... That's it. Or like uh, a, like a, a wobbling like a tumbler, tumbler is what is I was thinking. A wobbling take, take tumbler. Take a drinking glass and give it that... Uh, uh, we're, in, oh, okay. we're in New York. It should be a dreidel. Right? So if you look at a dreidel... dreidel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so like a so, dreidel. So that, that wobbles around. And so these things wobble on 20,000, 40,000, 100,000 year 
frequencies and they interact these and three they, effects and, and they interact and they effects. they change how much uh, sunlight gets to the poles how much sunlight gets to the tropics and that helps the ice ages grow and and, and recede but the interesting thing is that they haven't they haven't always happened right they've only been happening for about the last two and a half million years and the reason why we think that they've started happening in that relatively recent period is because the carbon dioxide level dropped to a to a level that allowed glaciers to expand in other words, the wobbling was going on in the past, but there was the wobbling has been going on. It was forever. overwhelmed yeah. by the greenhouse effect. Well, it didn't. It didn't make a difference because the planet was so warm. In the Cretaceous, the planet was really, really warm, and the dinosaurs there was running around, ancient dinosaurs running around in Antarctica. Swamps and uh, Swamps. crocodiles up inland in inland seas. Giant, totally. giant creatures. Sea level was about mass. eighty meters higher than eighty meters. Now. Yes, that's yeah. like that would go from. We're on the east coast of the United States. That would go where to? Chicago or something? Well, well now it, so a lot, a lot of the Mississippi Basin was a, was an inland sea uh, at that point. Um, the uh, the sea level in the Pliocene, which is not quite so far ago, about three million years ago, uh, there's there's a there's a, 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 a right in the middle of New Jersey. There's the old uh, Pliocene cliffs, mm -hmm. uh, but they're a long, long way from the coast now. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. The middle so, of New so Jersey. Let's so get let's way. get to this guy's question. Yeah. The answer is. No, we're not going to see any more ice ages. Uh, the next one would have been due uh, in about 30,000 or maybe maybe 50,000 years. Mm. Um, Sorry, but, I'm going to miss it. Yeah, you are, you are going to miss it. But it's, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because the, the time scale for the carbon that we put into the system is hundreds of thousands of years. And so no more ice ages. No more ice ages. That is really a striking thing, everybody. No more ice ages. Yeah. Because we we make hilarious jokes about the ice ages. I went to school in the Finger Lakes, which were carved by uh, glaciers mm -hmm. coming south. That's not going to happen anymore. Those were the days. Right. Are the glaciers, all the glaciers we know, going to go away? So almost all the mountain glaciers uh, that we know are receding, uh, some of them quite dramatically. Uh, the only part of the planet where ice is pretty stable is East Antarctica, which is the, the biggest chunk of ice. And that's very cold, very stable. Uh, and so that's the part that's, uh, that's going to stick around the longest. Uh, but the other bits, the ice on the uh, Antarctic Peninsula, Greenland is losing mass at yeah. about 250 gigatons of, uh, of water a year. Um, the, uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet is losing mass. So uh, everybody, and, if yeah. you want to see Glacier National Park, <laughs> for yeah. its mudslide national park, get going. Yeah, the, yeah. You're uh, watching and listening to Star Talk All Stars. I'm your guest host, Bill Nye, here with uh, our beloved Chuck Nice, man about the world, insightful provider of insights. And our special guest, our all-star this week, is Dr. Gavin Schmidt from, the, from NASA's Goddard uh, Institute for Space Studies right here in New York City. The town's so nice, they named it twice. And this week on Cosmic Queries, it's all about climate change all the time. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Star Talk. This is not just Star Talk, everybody. This is Star Talk All Star Edition, and I'm here with Dr. Gavin Schmidt from NASA's Goddard Center for Space Studies, right here in New York City, New York, New York. The town's so nice, we named it twice. And Chuck Nice, who's well, he's pretty nice, a uh, man about the world. <laughs> Seems so convinced. A regular, about that. <laughs> doing my best here. You have, you have a family, exactly. But uh, we are talking this week is cosmic queries, your questions from all over the electric social media out there on this planet. And this week is all about climate change, which, as you may know, is a subject uh, deeply important to me. And uh, simply be, uh, not just because you have a book called Unstoppable about climate change, not just because of that. What we're going to do about it, and because also Dr. Schmidt has a book, Climate Change Picturing the Science. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's got lots of pictures in it. How long have you been compiling pictures uh, having to do with climate change? So I, I talked to actual photographers, and it turns out that my pictures really aren't very good, so we had to throw out all of those and just use theirs instead. Uh, but they're great photos, uh, and these people have been traveling the world, finding interesting stories, and they're stories that you, that you can't tell in the news, and they're not being told in the magazines. For example? So uh, how do you uh, talk about uh, changes in uh, you know, plants as they move north, as it gets warmer, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, trying to track the uh, the kudzu, which used to be oh like, a, like a deep south thing, but now it's right here. It's like it's 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 on Long Island. It's My in, father it's in New Jersey was a very good Boy Scout, and the joke that they had this would be in what pick a number nineteen twenty. 
Mm-hmm. 19, what's it called? 1928. The joke was you put your ear to kudzu, you could hear it growing. <laughs> <laughs> and that was 100 years, oh, but 90 years ago. Yeah, that's not so funny anymore. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so stuff has yeah. taken over everything. Yeah, so they're, ta- they're, they're taking pictures they're, and they're doing great art and great journalism. And we, the scientists, are kind of helping them put it together, give it context and explain, you know, what the big patterns that you're seeing are, not just in ecosystems, but on, on you know, in, in sea level rise or in technology changes or, you know, just how people go about finding out what's going on in the world. Awesome. Well, Chuck, I was just going to say, I'm really, this is a very serious topic and we talk about it you know, scientifically, but the big thing that I'm always running is what are we going to do about it? What are mm-hmm. we going to do? So Chuck, we have a question. A yes, we do. We do have a query. And, and speaking of what are we going to do about it, uh, John P. Garrett from Facebook wants to know this. How effective are the policies for dealing with climate change proposed for the immediate future? Are we doing anything about this? Are we really doing anything? And by not just we, I mean the, the three of us. the three of us. Um, I mean our government, worldwide government. Right. What are the policies in place right now that will help this? So there's actually a few things that are making a difference. Uh, so uh, restrictions on coal power plants, uh, those are making a difference. Coal is the worst fuel that we can have for putting, uh, for putting out carbon dioxide. And here's the and bad it. news, everybody. We'll never run out of coal. Yeah. There's just, it's limitless. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, not limitless. Right. No, there's, there's right. so there's much coal everywhere. Everywhere. Way too much. all over the world. It's just too yeah. easy. Uh, things like the CAFE standards uh, in the U.S., things like the renewable standards for... Um, CAFE the, is... Uh, the, uh, the fuel emission standards uh, but, for, uh, for, for cars. Fleet or, emissions. That's right. Um, the uh, increasing amount of electric vehicles instead of uh, internal combustion engines. Uh, the renewable standards at the state level for, you know, making like 5, 10, 15% be, um, be produced from renewable sources. Uh, all of those things uh, are actually making a difference. Now, the question is, are they enough uh-huh. to take us so the way I like to describe it, we, after COP21 in Paris, this <laughs> big conference on climate change in Paris, you could say we've taken our foot off the accelerator, but we haven't really gotten around to putting our foot on the brake. No. And we're getting closer and closer to the cliff, and uh, we're going to go rebel without a cause right off it. Now, that, why this is obvious to everybody, but nobody's doing anything about it, is that's a big uh, philosophical question, a deep question. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't humankind get to work on this? Why wouldn't we? Why, we got, uh, it seems to be too big a problem. And just to get all conspiratorial on you, there's no question that the fossil fuel industry has worked very hard to obfuscate things, to make it hard to understand what they're doing and to defeat, to derail laws. Like the president of the United States tried to have this uh, restricting carbon emissions from coal-fired power plants. It was derailed and well, but these things are ongoing. Like anything that EPA does is always litigated. And that was true for the mercury regulations. It was true for acid rain. Eventually, it will come through. But it's a slow process. And, and we're getting so closer to the cliff. Well, so speaking the, the, of the cliff, yeah. speaking of the cliff and, and Thelma and Louise and all of us sure, going yeah, yeah. off holding hands over, yes, you yes. know, with the cop lights flashing in the background. Is there an actual tipping point where we can say, good night, people. That's it. Well, the number you guys like to throw in is, is two degrees Celsius. Is that right? So here, I'm, I'm going to argue a little bit. Okay. Please. So I don't actually think that there's one tipping point. I don't think there's ever going to be a point where we get to it and we say, oh, yeah, well, nothing worth doing. We are always going to be making decisions. And every time we make a decision, we can make a decision that's going to make the problem worse or make a decision that makes the problem better in the future. And we're always going to have to be making those decisions. Mm -hmm. And if you say, oh, it doesn't matter suddenly, that's not true, because you can always make it worse. Right? Oh, oh that's uh, great. We can make it worse. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's our new model. No, like, that's our new rallying cry. Don't make we it can worse. Make it worse. No, don't make it worse. <laughs> uh, and and so, you know, th- th- this talk of like, you know, uh, the the cliff. I, li- I like the I like the the metaphor, but actually, it, it's a little bit better. Like we're we're driving in the fog. And perhaps we're taking our foot off the accelerator, but we have no idea what's going on. We don't know if there's a cliff. We don't know if there's a boulder. We don't know if it's rough ground. We don't know if the road's going to run out. We don't know. 
Right. We have a pretty good idea that the sooner we come to a stop, the better it would be. Yeah? So, yes, we know that. We know that. <laughs> yeah, just driving in the fog like crazy, you know, is crazy. probably not going to work out. It's, it's, very, it's a curve in the road. Very James Dean of us. Right. Well, exactly. Yeah. Let yes. alone a turtle that's yeah. going across. Yes. Cool. All right. Well, there you have it. Let's, let's get another let's query. Let's get another query here. Cosmos. Uh, this is from Richard Martin, also calling to us uh, from Facebook, who says, Hello, Mr. Nye and Mr. Schmidt. An awesome guy reading this. Why? I don't know. Awesome guy reading this. That's you. I don't know. Like you're awesome. But see, did he really know that I was going to be the the the, the guest host? Did he of know course. that? I don't. Otherwise, know. he wouldn't have said it. it. Or maybe, <laughs> maybe exactly. Anyway, as you were saying. It all. Here's what he says. Uh, Richard says this. I've heard the sun expands and uses its hydrogen fuel. Is there any evidence that this has had an effect on climate change, or does it happen over too long of a time to measure? Oh, it's very measurable. Yes, it is uh, measurable. So, so the sun is uh, is a main sequence star. So, um, <laughs> over the the last four billion years that the Earth has has been around, the sun has got brighter by about thirty percent. Um, and in another two billion years, it will get large and brighter still. And in fact, it will evaporate. But the time scale is big. But the time scale is big. The time scale is, is billions of years. Yeah. And there is evidence that it's affected the climate. So if you go back in, uh, in time, you go back to, to the oldest rocks, the, the, the oldest evidence that we have, there is evidence that, that we went through periods that are called snowball earth, where the ice caps expanded uh, pretty much all the way to the equator. And there were, you know, obviously that was not particularly uh, helpful to life. Uh, but for periods of, you know, many, many millions of years, uh, the planet was a snowball. Now, that can't happen now because the sun is brighter. Uh, but, the, uh, but back then it was dimmer. And so things are a little bit more fragile. And so when you had wobbles that would put you into an ice age, those ice ages uh, could potentially cover the whole planet. But that's not happening now. That is not happening now. And so... It uh, the uh, the sun is getting is still getting brighter or not? Is it going so through it's, one it, of its it's, cycles? it's getting brighter on a very very long time scale. But actually, uh, there there are other things going on. Over so eleven we, we have, years, we right? have sunspot cycles. Uh, there's activity in the sun that kind of waxes and wanes over about eleven years. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we're just kind of coming off uh, a, a solar maximum. But in fact. Uh, this was a smaller solar maximum than than many of the previous ones. So, in fact, how do we determine what happened in the past on the sun uh, with respect to the sun and its uh, maxima and minima? Physics. <laughs> no, but go, but is it in the rocks? So there are. Uh, so the the solar activity also modulates the the cosmic rays that come in from all around the cosmos. Those cosmic rays are very high energy. They come into the atmosphere and they create isotopes: uh, carbon fourteen, uh, beryllium ten, uh, chlorine thirty. That don't occur any other place in uh, in in the Earth system, mm. and they'll just keep creating it. And so, when you have something that's that's made of air or made of carbon, uh, that's how you can do carbon dating, right? So, so you're not part of that. But if you go back, you can actually see that the that those. Uh, For those of you who are listening on the podcast, he's, his hands going up and down. My hands going up and down. Here we like go. A wave. Visually showing us the <laughs> ebb and flow. The ebb and uh, so the up and down. Yeah. These yes. cosmic rays will make some protons become neutrons. Some neutrons become protons. That's right. So so they'll hit they'll hit a nitrogen and they'll make a carbon fourteen. Yeah. Right. Or they'll hit nitrogen a, seven will become a carbon six plus an extra neutron. Uh, that's right. Oh, that's, that's fabulous. Yes. yes. So um, you see, see, this so is you, man, this is why you got to pay attention. Well, it's science. Science so people. Here's yeah. the thing what I say to everybody, because I deal with a lot of climate denial people. Mm -hmm. Okay, these isotopes are created in this special way. Yes. There's no other way to make these isotopes. Right. So there's nobody running around with a hypodermic needle making isotopes for kicks to fool people. <laughs> <laughs> so this ev these, when you have this evidence, it's incontrovertible. It's like, let's go, people. Right. Let's get this done. Let's get to work. Chuck. All right. Give us another query. Okay, so this is Russ... Ismailov. Uh, yes. Ismailov. Ismailov. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Ismailov? No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> no, it's on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you know how many times he's heard that joke? <laughs> I'm, yeah. sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Right now, Russ hates us. <laughs> Here's what Russ, uh, no, I, I included us, but you know it's me. Yeah. You I know. was going to say it's me. Uh, Go ahead. No, okay, so Russ wants to know this, and he's coming to us from Facebook. Does oil production affect the climate change directly or indirectly? Kind regards from Kazan, Russia. 
Well, if you're in the, I can tell you this, if you're producing oil, what they call synthetic crude oil, in, um, in uh, the tar sand region of Alberta, the province of Canada, in Western Canada, you are just a process to produce this uh, synthetic crude takes a tremendous amount of energy. 30% of the energy in the crude oil is used to produce the synthetic crude oil. And it's just pumping carbon dioxide in the air. And then when you burn the crude oil, the synthetic crude oil, wow. you pump even more, 30%. Yeah. It's extraordinary. And what they've done, just to whine and complain in Calgary, I was there in uh, end of August, beginning of September. They've created this boom and bust cycle in, in the economy. Mm -hmm. Put all their eggs in the synthetic crude basket, if I may. And uh, the place was not deserted, but there was very, there were very few people working. Yeah, and uh, it's just, it's you know, it I, couldn't be worse. That is fascinating. What you just, I, I can't believe I've never heard that before. Thirty percent. Oh man. Uh, so you. So it was discovered in 1884. A geologist running around the Athabasca River. Athabasca River runs through there, and it cuts a swath through the layers of soil, and you can see this layer of tar, uh -huh. and it's sandy tar sand. And the oil companies have had a uh, campaign to call it oil sand. Ah. But you pick up a handful of it, it is it's goo. tar. It's tar. <laughs> and um, it was, this guy said, boy, if you could exploit this, it'd be fantastic. So in the 1970s, some chemical engineers came up with a process to make it into very usable crude oil. Wow. So you're creating a crap load of pollution so that you can create a crap load yes. of pollution. Brilliant. <laughs> and, and accidentally just mess with the economy of this otherwise lovely province. Wow. Fantastic. Hey, but, Russ. Uh, but uh, uh, Gavin, you were going to chime in. Uh, so just to answer his question, it's indirect. Like it's not, you know, the, the, it's the burning of the oil that causes the carbon dioxide and all the other pollutants which, which have the effect. But I can tell you in oil field production, you're, you burn a lot of oil running pumps and generators and compressors. Yes. Yeah, no, so I used to I'm, work I'm, in the oil Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not, not, uh, not going to argue with that. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I was looking forward to the argument, but uh, I Sorry. guess we won't. Um, <laughs> We're not. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let us, uh, let's move on. Um, and this is from, uh, from Pete Nagy from Facebook. Pete wants to know this. Hey, Pete here from California. The sun is lauded being near limitless as a source of energy, but it isn't uh, technically limited by solar collectors. Right. After all, the sun isn't always shining down here on the ground. Yep. What are some of the possible solutions to this dilemma? Wow. Um, could we not tell these people? And could you guys just write it down for me so I can go, uh, you know, make a fortune and retire? <laughs> no, you can make a fortune. I tell all the all, everybody this. In okay, good. School. Then let's do that. A battery. If you had, we had better batteries. Yes. And uh, we have very good batteries, but they could be better and better energy storage systems, whatever that might be. It could be these great gravity, these giant pistons that go up and down. Molten salt is very Molten useful. Molten salt. Yes. We love that. Okay. Sorry, guys, uh, as, as the uh, non-scientist in the room, can we please have a little lesson on molten salt? Because <laughs> so, I know molten salt. <laughs> so what we do, it's a not that hard, oh. giant mirrors, and uh, you can see them from airplanes here in the U.S., giant mirrors concentrate solar power, beam it up to a big black ball mm -hmm. full of, it's largely sodium chloride, table salt, right, yes. with a little calcium chloride, this other the salt you melt snow in front of your... Right. On your sidewalk, a mixture, and it gets liquid. It's so freaking hot, it gets liquid. And so when the sun's not shining overnight, the stuff stays hot. It's so massively, uh, it's, it holds so much heat. Its thermal capacity is so high. So you can continue to run a steam turbine all night long. Yeah. Gotcha. If you have it worked out. All right. And we're just scratching the solar, uh, con concentrated solar power surface on this. Unbelievable. The potential for this is enormous. And the place that also ironically has huge potential for it is in the Middle East where all this oil is produced. They'd have these concentrated solar power collectors. Yeah, here it gets hot there. That's right. <laughs> so you are watching uh, Star Talk All Stars. We're here with Chuck Nice and me, Bill Nye, your host. And this week, our all star is Dr. Gavin Schmidt from the Goddard Institute for Space Studies here in New York City. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. Welcome back to Star Talk All Star Edition. 
I'm your host, Bill Nye, here with our beloved Chuck Nice, Man About the Earth. Yes. And speaking of the Earth, our all-star this week is Dr. Gavin Schmidt from the Goddard Center for Space Studies, uh, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies here in New York City, which is part of NASA. Right? It is You're indeed. a NASA employee, ultimately. I am. And this week on Cosmic Queries, your queries from the cosmos are all about climate change. And here to read the next query, or do you want to talk about salt some more, molten salt? Well, no, I just found that to be a, a, a completely fantastic idea. Oh, I don't cool. understand why oh, these— hot. They, yeah, it's hot. Very hot. That's hot. Uh, you know, I just don't understand why these type of alternatives are not put forward in a, such a manner where there's a public awareness. Well, if you live in Las Vegas, there are three yes. solar, huge solar plants out there, and uh, in um, it ends with a paw sound in California— there's a big Ivan Pa. Thank you. Yes. Ivan Pa, Ivan Pa. Ivan Pa. Ivan Pa, California. There thank you. Is a huge concentrated solar uh, collector system, CSP, concentrated solar power. And this is a thing we're just getting started on this chuck. Now, uh, just speaking as a political commentator and guy who's thought about this a little bit. When you have a standing army on the other side of the world to protect oil fields. Yes. That is effectively a subsidy for that form of energy. It costs a billions of dollars to maintain a military on the other side of the world. If we were to encourage concentrated solar power, photovoltaics, wind energy at that same, a tenth of that scale, we would have all of these systems in place in 30 years. Yes, but then how would we destabilize the Middle East? <laughs> Great question. I think no. that's not that hard. <laughs> with, with podcasts from, and Facebook. Right, exactly. <laughs> no, it seems... From, 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 <laughs> no, that thing's been going on. It's a whole you, book, no, you, it's called the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. The conflict's been going on They don't need time. any help is what you say, right? No, <laughs> they, no they actually do need a lot of help. I was going to say. No, I mean to destabilize. Yeah, they yeah, don't need we're all help. being hilarious. Yeah. All right, here we go. Uh, you know, a cosmic query. Here we go. Uh, uh, this is from Benjamin, who is at Benard3 on Twitter. Uh, Gavin said, I wasn't giving Twitter any love, so let's go to Twitter. Uh, here's what he says. People emphasize negative aspects of uh, climate change, but are there any foreseeable positives? Hmm. Well, oh, so let me, let me give you one. Please. Right? Um, so, so I'm English, and... Uh, oh, do you know... Uh <laughs> I do. Yes, yes, yes. We're, we're, we hang out all the time at the palace, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, and and for many years, many years, uh, you know, there were there was such a thing as as English wine, and there was an old joke in, in Victorian English wine. Yes, in the Victorian uh, period, that it would take four people to drink English wine. One to drink the wine, two people to hold the person down, and another person to pour it into their throat. Pretty funny. Ah. Very troubling. Yes. Okay. But now it turns out that there are more vineyards in uh, in England than there have ever been in history, and in fact that the, the uh, when you say history champ- you're over five hundred oh, years, thousand years, thousand years. Yes, thousand. Yeah. Years. We have we have records of vineyards in England going back to the Doomsday Book uh, uh, over a thousand years ago, um, but there's more now, and the wine they're producing in blind tastings against champagne actually wins. So so oh, wine quality in shot. in England. Uh, is actually now on a par with the best that the French can produce. Boy, they're going to, the French people are going to be unglued so, about that I, I, situation. I, absolutely. So, I, <laughs> so, so in fact, uh, the, the champagne companies are buying up uh, swaths of uh, what are called the South Downs in, in the UK because they know that the, the temperatures in Champagne are now at the limit. So if it gets much warmer in Champagne region, uh, they won't be able to make as good Champagne okay. there, and they're thinking about moving their production to the UK. So, so they, that they, will be a foreseeable a benefit cooler. For English wine drinkers. The UK is a little cooler. In, yes, it's a little bit further north, but it's very similar soils, very similar terroir. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, now it's, uh, it's, it's actually happening. So there's your answer, Benjamin. Uh, the positive will be you get to piss off French winemakers. <laughs> well, what it means, but writ large, is agriculture is going to change. That's exactly right. So, so you're seeing the same thing in the US, right? So uh, Napa Valley, where we're producing a lot of great wine now, is at the limit of how hot it needs to be. If it gets much hotter, it's going to be hotter. So production is moving to Oregon, Washington, uh, Washington State. Yeah. There's some excellent, excellent wines that are really emerging there. And, and that's and part British of, and British Columbia even, yeah. yes. So, I mean, I tasted wines in British Columbia maybe 20 years ago, and the, the same joke would have been true then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but now they're actually... They're actually so agriculture is going to change. The whole problem, everybody, the way I see it, is it's how fast it's changing. 
Yeah. We have an interstate highway system. We have trains in Britain for uh, carrying produce to market or carrying produce to the the winery where you're going to make the grapes into wine, for example, or the oats into oatmeal or what have you. But we're not set up to have that, all that production move farther and farther north or farther and farther from the equator, and rain patterns are changing. Yeah, I mean, for, for, for niche things like vineyards, you know, they're pretty much on the ball, and so they, they, they pay attention to these things and move things along quite quickly. Mm -hmm. But your bigger problem is, is the staples, not, not the luxury goods. You know, right. uh, wheat, corn, uh, barley, uh, soybeans, all of those things are affected by... Uh, Better known as weather. food. 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 For most of the world, yes. <laughs> straight up food. Let's try another one, Chuck. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's let's just very quickly in that same uh, in that same vein. Tobias, who is at Miko on Twitter, on Twitter, wants to know this: Does animal agriculture have any impact on mm -hmm. climate change? So the way we grow and raise our food, uh, you know, our, our livestock, does that hurt or help climate change in any way? So. You know, if you run a farm, uh, you can integrate the the animals in the farm so that they eat a lot of the waste, and uh, you know, so that's 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 okay. By waste, you mean uh, silage? Uh, yeah, exactly. I, like pigs stuff. will will eat anything, and so you know, that's a good way of recycling Corn stuff stovers. that would otherwise be uh, be uh, uh, wasted. Uh, but uh, your 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 big climate impacts come from cows and sheep. And they have this second stomach, mm -hmm. uh, which has what's called enteretic fermentation, where you produce a ton of methane. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very powerful greenhouse gas. It's natural very powerful. gas. Yeah, it's, it's basically the same stuff as natural gas. Um, and since oh, we Believe me, I know. Because <laughs> you have three kids. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, yes, yes. And your wife has pointed out. <laughs> exactly. on, so on. Okay, well, that's too much information. <laughs> it comes at their burping. This is a myth. It's not coming out their tails. It's 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 mostly their mostly uh, cow burps, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and we've increased the number of cows and sheep enormously in the last uh, century. And that's certainly contributed to the fact that levels of methane are more than double what they were 150 years ago. Methane or methane is a more it's, powerful... It's all about me, Bill. Yeah. yeah. Uthane, <laughs> is, uh, uthane is much more powerful uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide even. Right? Yeah, pound less pound for pound. But yeah. there's much less of it. The carbon dioxide is a much more powerful thing because there's more of it. But So uh, uh, raising livestock uh, has a huge effect, Chuck, or yeah. Tobias, to answer your question. And the other thing, just writ large, when I was young... There were three billion people in the world. My, when my grandfather was young, there were one and a half billion people. Now there are over seven, 7.3 7 billion people. And everybody wants protein. Everybody wants to eat. And here we are. Yes. Going through this stuff uh, and the uh, the farming and the agriculture and the animals. And uh, we're so adding when, nothing to the, to so, the uh, atmosphere. So when they say. Gasoline on when, a fire. When they say one day vegetarian actually helps the world. Uh, ecology. Yeah. That's actually yeah. true then. Uh, yeah, that's actually true. Uh, yeah. So so um, if you take a diet that's a vegetarian diet, compare it to a diet that's that's got a lot of meat in it, uh, your environmental footprint, uh, not just in, uh, in in methane, but also in the fuel that's uh, that's used to, to transport and create these things, the amount of fertilizer that's being used, the amount of nitrate runoff that's going into the rivers, which is creating the dead zone, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> It all adds up. Uh, it, it, all, it all adds up. So, so you have yeah. a number. Or you felt like you were building to a number. I, I may. I, I could have made up a number, but I, I didn't actually have the it's number. It's big. Yes, it's a big, big number. <laughs> so, <laughs> as we like to say, Chuck. Yes. If you don't like regulation now, just wait till it gets to the point where they we somebody has to regulate the amount of protein, or rather, animal protein you take in. Right. And we're actually regulating farmers and to produce less uh, of livestock protein. That's it's could be a big deal, everybody. Uh, yeah. So if you like to worry about things, you're living at a great time. There you go. Take a yes. And, and believe me, that's going to be a tough fight. Uh, just ask Oprah. So um, Paul Bunyan wants to know this. And this he's he come, that's what he says his name is. And uh, he is at Matthew uh, Birch. With the rising ocean levels mm -hmm. due to polar melt, how soon before the Hudson River becomes the Gulf of the Hudson? And, and let me just add an addendum, you know, uh, to the how soon will this have a um, verifiable and uh, measurable effect on our coastal regions? Because when you look at all of the world, most people live on the coast of wherever. That's right. So, so already. 
Already we're seeing uh, um, the number of coastal flooding days is increasing all up and down the East Coast from Miami to Newport to uh, to Boston. Uh, the uh, storm surges that we're seeing when you have a storm, wherever the storm is, it's it, it has more damage because the sea level has risen about a foot in the last uh, 100 years. And it's increasing faster now than perhaps any time in the last 3,000 years. And that's because of polar melts it's because the water itself is getting warmer and so it's expanding uh and that's it's happening right now so the, they have an expression in florida nuisance flooding nuisance flooding nuisance flooding now everybody when you think of floods you might get into some biblical thing where everybody's underwater in an enormous uh, hundreds of feet underwater 100 meters underwater uh, but the nuisance flooding, which uh, uh, is uh, inducing insurance companies not to provide insurance to where you park your car ah. because salt water is getting in your wheel wells. It's just a, a few centimeters, a few inches deep. But if you put a few inches of water on the floor of your house, you ruin almost everything. Gotcha. You ruin the stove. You ruin all your furniture. You ruin your carpets. You ruin your bedding. You ruin everything. And so this expression nuisance is kind of shorthand for you're not in good hands. You're on your own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, I said to um, this guy, Mr. Hill, who's a legislator in Florida, I, uh, I said, what are you going to do? He, he represents Pensacola, Florida, and they have nuisance flooding continually. I said, what are you going to do when everybody moves? You know, or they're going to move, he says. They're gonna, or where are they going to move to? Mm. How are they going to displace themselves if you're a middle income or lower income person? How do you pick up everything? And where do you go to get a job and so on? And that's in the U.S., which is uh, civilization. Wait till you're in the developing world where you just don't have resources. Jeez. Right? God. Man. Let's get to, let's, let's raise awareness, Chuck. Read yes. another query. I'm going to raise awareness. I'm going to, uh, God, this is, this is really serious stuff. Well, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, here's something that uh, <laughs> Kevin, he's given us. He's given it the wry smile. It's upbeat. Take it. Uh, here's a little something that uh, I wanted to get. And, you know, since you have Unstoppable and since you are a. Expert, he's got climate change picturing the science. I do. Yeah. Change, can, uh, can How many you, books in a carton? 20? They make great gifts, 16, everybody. Yeah. 60. They make great <laughs> gifts. The Equinox <laughs> is coming up. <laughs> so can we have uh, three? Just major points, of uh, three major talking points, three tips that we can put out to kind of silence the climate-denying arguments. Well, my big thing is why do you really think that your intuition about weather and about your whole life is more accurate at predicting the future than the world's climate scientists. And then to follow that up with, do you think the world's climate scientists are in a conspiracy? Gavin, are you in a conspiracy where you guys text each other? <laughs> yes, well, we, 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 get, uh, we get signals from the vegetarian overlords. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, really? To, to tell, well, oh, you're yes, the one. Yes, when he yes. says text, I was <laughs> thinking, you know, dick pics, but yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Our talk is well, an that, entertainment that, show. That, that, that escalated. You know what? I can listen. <laughs> wow. I'm hanging with Brett Favre. What can I say? Yeah, wow. <laughs> it's unexpected. Uh, yes. But are there three tips? We have just a few seconds left before break. Gavin, you got any ideas? Look at the evidence. The planet is warming. One. We, we understand why. Two. We're not stopping our emissions, so it's going to get worse. There you go. It's that simple. So, uh, Chuck, Gavin, the answer to this problem is the evidence is overwhelming. Let's get to work. Is Absolutely. that right? I like that. This is Star Talk All Star Edition. I'm here with Chuck Nice, a regular man about the universe, and Dr. Gavin Schmidt from the Goddard Center, Goddard Institute for Space Studies, part of NASA, right here in New York City. And this show has been about climate change. I've been your guest host, Bill Nye. Uh, tune in to Star Talk every week and turn it up loud. We'll see you next time. This is Star Talk.